Chapter 33, Chicken and Blackberry Kisses. Gramps barreled through Wyoming like a house on fire. We snaked through winding roads where the trees leaned close, rustling rush, rush, rush. The road curved alongside rivers and rolled and gabbled. Hurry, hurry, hurry. It was late when we arrived at Yellowstone. All we got to see that evening was a hot spring. We walked on the boardwalk, uh, boardwalks placed across the bubbling mud. Huzzah, huzzah, Graham said. We stayed at the old faithful inn in the frontier cabin. I'd never seen Graham so excited. She could not wait for the next morning. We're going to see old faithful, she said, over and over. It won't take too lo very long, will it? I said, and I, and I felt like I... I, like I felt like a mule saying it because Graham was so looking forward to it. Don't you worry, Salamanca, Graham said. We'll just watch that old geyser blow up and then we'll hit the road. I prayed all night long to the elm tree outside. I prayed that we would not get in an accident, that we would get to Lewiston, Idaho in time for my mother's birthday, and that we would bring her home. Later, I would realize that I had prayed for the wrong things. That night, Graham was so excited that she could not sleep. She rambled on about all sorts of things. She said to Gramps, Remember that letter from the Eggman that you found under the mattress? Dang it, of course I remember. We had a wing ding of an argument over it. You tried to tell me that you had no dang idea how it got there. You said the Eggman must have slipped, it, slipped into the bedroom and put it there. Well, I want you to know that I put it there. I know that. Gramps said. I'm not a complete noodle. It's the only love letter anyone ever wrote me, Graham said. You never wrote me any love letters. Well, why didn't you ever tell me you wanted one? To me, Graham said, your grandfather nearly killed the Eggman over that letter. Hell's bells, Gramps said. He wasn't worth killing. Maybe not, Graham said, but Gloria was. Oh, yes, Gramps said, placing his hand on his heart and pretending to swoon. Gloria. Cut that out, Graham said. She rolled over on her side and said to me, Tell me about tell me about Peavy. Tell me that story, but don't make it too awfully sad. She folded her hands on her chest. Tell me what happened with the lunatic. When I saw the picture of the lunatic on Sergeant Bickle's desk, I tore out of that office faster than lightning. I ran past Sergeant Bickle, standing in the parking lot. There was no sign of Phoebe. I ran all the way to her house. As I was passing Mrs. Cadaver's house... Mrs. Partridge called to me from her porch. I stopped. You look all dressed up, I said. Are you going somewhere? Oh, yes, she said. I'm readable. You mean ready? Yes, readable as can be. She tottered down the steps, swinging her cobra cane in front of her. Are you walking? I asked. She reached down and touched her legs. Isn't that what you call it when you move your legs like I'm doing? No, I mean, are you walking to wherever you're going? Oh, no, it's much too far for these legs Jimmy's coming. He'll be here any minute. Mrs. Partridge continued down the front walk. I was amazed that she didn't fall. She stepped out so confidently, barely using her cane at all. A car pulled up in front of the house. There he is, she said. She called to the driver. I'm readable. I said I would be, and here I am. The driver leaped out of the car. Sal, he said. I had no idea you two were neighbors. It was Mr. Berkway. We're not neighbors, I said. It's Phoebe, actually, who is the neighbor. Is that right, he said. He opened the car door for Mrs. Partridge. Come on, Mom, he said. Let's get a move on. Mom, I said. I looked at Mrs. Partridge. This is your son? You're his mother? Why, of course, Mrs. Partridge said. This is my little Jimmy. But he's a Berkway, Mrs. Partridge said. I was a Berkway once. Then I was a Partridge. I'm still a Partridge. Then who is Mrs. Cadaver? I said, my little Mar Margie, she said. She was a Berkway too. Now she's a cadaver. I said to Mr. Berkway, Mrs. Cadaver is your sister? We're twins, Mr. Berkway said. They're just alike, Mrs. Partridge said. When they had driven away, I knocked at Phoebe's door, knocked and knocked. There was no answer. At home, I dialed Phoebe's number over and over. No answer. The next day at school, I was relieved to see Phoebe. Where were you? I said. I phoned and phoned. I have something to tell you. She turned away. I don't want to talk about it, she said. But Phoebe, I wish I do not wish to discuss it, she said. I could not figure out what on earth was the matter with her. 
It was a terrible day. We had tests in math and science. In French, our teacher lectured us for the entire class period about how sloppy our work was. At lunch, Phoebe ignored me. Then came English. Mr. Berkway skipped into the room. People were gnawing on their fingers and tapping their feet and wriggling around and generally getting ulcers, wondering if Mr. Berkway was going to read, their, read from the journals. I just kept staring at him. He and Margaret Cadaver were twins. Was that possible? The most disappointing part of that piece of knowledge was that there was not going to be that he was not going to fall in love with Mrs. Cadaver and marry her and take her away. Mr. Berkway opened up, opened a cupboard, pulled out the journals, slipped the yellow paper over the cover of one, and read. This is what I like about Jane. There was, a, there was no Jane, of course. He was substituting a name. She is smart, but she doesn't act like she knows everything. She is cute. She smells good. She is cute. She makes, she makes me laugh. She is cute. She is friendly. And... Did I mention that she is cute? While Mr. Berkway was reading, I got a prickly feeling up and down my arms. I was wondering if Ben had written this about me, but then I realized that Ben didn't even know me when he, when he wrote this journal. A little buzz was going around the room as people shifted in their seats. Christy was smiling. Megan was smiling. Beth Ann was smiling. Mary Lou was smiling. Every, everyone in the room was, was smiling. Each girl thought that this had been about, written about her. I looked carefully at each of the boys. Alex was gazing nonchalantly at Mr. Berkway. Shiguru was asleep in the back row. Others were doodling, and then I saw Ben. He was sitting with his hands over his ears, staring down at his desk. The prickly feeling traveled all the way up my neck, and then went skipping down my spine. He did write that, but he did not write it about me. Mr. Berkway exclaimed, Ah, love, ah, life. Sighing, he pulled out another journal and read, Jane doesn't know the first thing about boys. She once asked me what kisses taste like. So you could tell she had never kissed anyone. I told her they taste like chicken, and she believed me. She is so dumb sometimes. Mary Lou Finney almost jumped straight out of her chair. You cabbage head, she said to Beth Ann. You beef brain. Beth Ann was winding, was winding a strand of hair around, her, around and around her finger. Mary Lou stood up. I did not believe you. I did not... I. I do, too, know what they taste like, and it isn't chicken. Mr. Berkway looked astonished at this outburst. Ben drew a cartoon. It showed two stick figures kissing, and in the air above their heads was a cartoon bubble with a chicken inside. The chicken was saying, bark, bark, bark. Mr. Berkway turned a few pages in the journal and read, I hate doing this. I hate to write. I hate to read. I hate journals. I especially hate English where teachers only talk about idiot symbols. I hate that idiot poem about snow, the snowy woods, and I hate it when people say the woods in the poem that symbolize death or beauty or sex or any old thing you want. I hate that. Maybe the woods are just woods. Beth Ann stood up and stared defiantly around the room. Mr. Berkway, she said, I hate this. I do hate school. I do hate books. I do hate English. I do hate symbols. And I most especially hate these idiot journals. There was such a hush in the room. Mr. Berkway stared at Beth Ann for a minute. And in that minute, I was reminded of Mrs. Cadaver. For that brief time, his eyes looked just like hers. When I, and I was afraid he was going to strangle Beth Ann. But then he smiled, and his eyes became friendly, enormous cow eyes once more. I think he hypnotized her, because Beth Ann sat down very slowly. Mr. Berkway said, Beth Ann, I know exactly how you feel. Exactly. I love this passage. You do? She said. It's so honest. I had to admit, you couldn't get more honest than Beth Ann telling her English teacher that she hated symbols and English and idiot journals. Mr. Berkway said, I used to feel exactly like this. You did? Mr. Berkway said, I could not understand what all the fuss was about about symbols. He rummaged around in his desk. I want to show you something. He was pulling papers out and, and pulling papers out and hanging them around. Finally, he held up a picture. Ah, here it is, dynamite. He held the picture up the picture in front of Ben. What is this? He he asked Ben. Ben said, That's a vase, obviously. Mr. Berkway held the drawing in front of Beth Ann, who looked as if she might cry. Mr. Berkway said, Beth Ann, what do you see? A little teardrop down, her, down on her cheek. It's okay, Beth Ann, Mr. Berkway said. What do you see? I don't see, I don't see any idiot vase, she said. I see two people. They're looking at each other. Right, Mr. Berkway said. Brave. 
I'm right, Beth Ann said. Brave? Ben said, huh? People? I was thinking the same thing myself. What two people? Mr. Berkway said to Ben, and you were right too. Brave, he asked everyone else. How many see a vase? About half of the class raised their hands. And, a, and how many see two faces? And the rest of the class raised their hands. Then Mr. Berkway pointed out how you could see both. If you looked only at the white part in the center, you could clearly see the vase. If you looked only at the dark parts of the, on the side, you could see two profiles. The curvy sides on the vase became the outline of the two heads facing each other. People were saying, wow, neat, man, cool. Shiguru Misako, uh, and Misako were giggling away, and their hands were covering their mouths. Yes, yes, they said, yes, yes. Mr. Berkway said that the drawing was a bit like symbols. Maybe the artist only intended to draw a vase. And maybe some people look at this picture and see only that vase. That is fine. But if some people look at, and see, look at it and see faces, what's wrong with that? It is faces to the person who is looking at it and beside. Uh, and and uh, what is more magnificent, you might see both. Beth Ann said, two for your money? Isn't it interesting, Mr. Berkway said, to find both? Isn't it interesting to discover that snowy woods could be death and beauty and even, I suppose, sex? Wow, literature. Did he say sex, Ben said? He copied the drawing into his book. I thought Mr. Berkway was finished with the journals for the day. But, he said, let me find one or two more selections I'll take off the bottom. I haven't read this far yet. I'll choose randomly. He made a great show of closing his eyes and pulling something from near the bottom of the stack. With his eyes closed, he slipped the yellow paper cover over it. But it was too late. I knew it was mine, because I had not written in a blue booklet. Everyone else had. Mine was on plain notebook paper. I wanted to die. Mr. Berkway read, She popped the blackberries into her mouth, and then she looked all around. I could hardly bear it. I wanted him to stop. He didn't. He read on. She took two quick steps up to the maple tree and threw her arms around it and kissed it soundly. People were giggling. Oh, how I wanted Mr. Berkway to stop. But he did not, he went on. I thought I could detect a small stain, small dark stain, from a blackberry kiss. Ben looked at me from across the room. After Mr. Berkway read about my mother's blackberry kiss, he read about how I kissed the tree and how I have kissed all different kinds of trees since and how each tree has a special taste all its own. And mixed in with that taste is the taste of blackberries. By now, because both Ben and Phoebe were staring at me, everyone else stared too. She kisses trees, Megan said. I might have died right then and there if Mr. Berkway had not immediately picked up another journal. He stabbed his finger into the middle of the page and read, I am very concerned about Mrs. Mr. Berk Berkway stared down at the page. It looked as if he couldn't quite read the writing, or maybe he was just trying to think of a name to substitute the real one. He start started again. I am very concerned about Mrs. And again, he stopped. He cleared his throat and tried once more. I am very concerned about Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Corpse. Her suspicious behavior suggests that she had murdered her own husband. Mr. Berkway stopped. Phoebe was sitting quite still, but her eyes blinked rapidly. Go on, Ben said. Finish. You could tell that Mr. Berkway was regretting that he had ever started this business with the journals. But all around the room, people were shouting, Yes, finish! And so reluctantly, he continued. I believe she has buried him in her garden. The bell rang. People were going berserk. Wow, a murder. Who wrote that? Is it real? I am sure they continued along those lines, but I did not stay to listen. I was out of the room faster than anything, chasing after Phoebe. I heard Mr. Berkway call Phoebe's name, but she was gone. I ran down the hall. Megan called out after me. You kiss trees! I tore out of the building. No sign of Phoebe. Idiot journals, I thought. Gurdarn idiot journals.